right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jim Huntsinger um, of Le with Lean Frontiers. And if you're new to this, welcome. And here, there we go. On the screen, um, you can see Patrick Anderson. Um, a little bit uh, about Patrick. Patrick is a Klingit Indian from the southeastern Alaska who came out of poverty in a housing project to graduate from Princeton University and the University of Michigan Law School. After practicing law in Alaska, he began working as a CEO for a consortium of Alaska Native tribes, administrating um, health care, behavioral and social programs. And in 2004, he learned about lean thinking from Brian Jones, at that time the president of Nipro uh, Precision Plastics. But for the past 18 years, he has applied lean in manufacturing, healthcare, behavioral health, administrative processes, housing, and developing a hypothesis for restoring healthcare. Also, Patrick is a longtime friend and colleague of myself and Lean Frontiers and has presented and attended many of our summits over the years. So we're thrilled to have Patrick here. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, and welcome, everyone. I'm very pleased to uh, have you here. The way I uh, hope to present uh, is that I have a PowerPoint that uh, won't, I, I hope, take uh, too long. Uh, I want to introduce a number of problems that Alaska Native villages face. The title of this is to use lean thinking on transforming communities. Uh, and that's been a large part of what I've been thinking about for the last 15 years as I've encountered uh, problems. And I'll go through, I'm gonna uh, go on to screen share, put up a PowerPoint. Uh, I am not quite sure if I can see hands are raised, but uh, I'll try and monitor uh, the chat. If someone has questions and I'm not being uh, real clear, uh, please let me know. Uh, hopefully the chat will remain after I do the screen share. That tends to take up uh, all of my screen. So here I go. And Patrick, I'll, I'll help you if anybody puts questions in the chat as well too. try to help out if you don't get a chance to see them. Okay, great. Now has my screen uh, showed up? It's in the process. There it goes. So it's there. All right. All right, I can see uh, Jim and myself up in the corner. So if, if there is something coming in in the chat, Jim, I appreciate your, your work. Okay. So um, I call my business future state. It's a concept that I learned from my senseis. Uh, they talk about how you need to have a dream or a vision, uh, a long-term future state of what you think you're going to be uh, in order to explain it to people and try to get them to buy into it. I call this one a village of the future, although it's uh, about using lean thinking to envision what you want your community to look like. And I got this idea from a number of sources, but first let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, in addition to what Jim shared with you. And... Let me see if it, there it advances. Um, as a matrilineal uh, society, my Clinket uh, culture um, follows our mother's clan. As a result, I am a Thunderbird or Shankukedi. The prior screen showed uh, the screen in our house uh, in Yakutat. Uh, it is a Thunderbird carved uh, large screen. My Clinket name given to me about 20 years ago is Dachudain. Um, in, in my culture, we have elders. Uh, my expertise is in business. Uh, as I show, I'm an experienced CEO. I was lean management science trained. Uh, and I am a continual student trying to learn all the time. So I try and come to see Jim and his team uh, relatively frequently. Good, it's moving forward. This is my Clinket homeland. Uh, on the left side, you'll see Glacier Bay National Park. Uh, up in the upper left is a red dot. That is the Dry Bay National Preserve. And just above that is the community of Yakutat. That is where my mother was born. Dry Bay was abandoned uh, after the 
Spanish flu in 1918 decimated a lot of the clan houses. The picture down in the lower right is Dry Bay itself, and the mountain in the background is Mount Fort Fairweather. It's about 14,000 feet high. Uh, the ocean is off to the right. This is a place where there are great runs of salmon. Uh, just to the left of Mount Fairweather is the Glacier Bay National Park. My father was Aleut, so in our matrilineal way, I'm a child of the Aleut. This picture is my dad's home country. Cordova um, is off to the right, really close to the Copper River. If you enjoy great salmon, Copper River red salmon, or the first salmon to come out of Alaska uh, and go to restaurants. Unfortunately, uh, I see that it often costs $69, $79 a pound at the Pike's Place Market when it first comes out. Uh, this also is the region that I began working in with villages as the chief executive officer of Chugachmut. Uh, that is where I learned and started to apply the lean thinking through my sensei, uh, Dr. Tom Jackson. My connection with lean frontiers. As a newbie, I found their Lean Accounting Summit in 2005. I brought my team to the Accounting Summit. Uh, I also brought a second team in 2019 to Jekyll Island. Uh, and both teams had individual executives whose thinking was transformed enough for us to implement Lean principles. Uh, Jim, Dwayne, and staff through the years have been passionate lean scholars and have taught me a lot. And I say to them, Gunakchish, which is thank you in Tlingit. My inspiration for thinking about communities in a village of the future is Deming's Out of the Crisis. Um, Toyota as well learned a lot from Deming and Toyota has a strong commitment in its respect for people platform to the communities that it belongs to. Uh, when Deming said long-term commitment and new philosophy is required to seek transformation, uh, I began to think about how you did that not only for the business, but for the communities that we live, work and serve in. I'm going to ask each of you to do something for me. I want you to move into slow thinking and out of judgment. This is what I ask my employees to do for the next 20 minutes as I do this presentation. I'm asking if you would abandon fast thinking or system one thinking, and I'll explain that in the next slide and move into slow thinking or system two. Don't judge what you hear. Instead, think about it. According to the theories, your reaction will to be up to apply your judgment. And those are the biases that you've developed over time to help you solve everyday problems. They are important. They're a part of the culture that you grow and evolve in. But many of them are wrong, as it was proven to me many times by lean senseis. Lean thinking by teams is designed so that you can slow down your thinking. Uh, and here's why. Daniel Kahneman, a psychologist, won the Nobel Prize for Economics uh, with this theory, looking at biases which are created by system one thinking to solve problems immediately. System two thinking is slowing down. So what I'm asking you to do is to stop judging, look at what's being presented and move into slow thinking because towards the end, what I want to do uh, after presenting the problem statements is to get you to help me envision what a new village, a new community should look like in order to implement some of these principles of lean problem solving on a community wide level. Here is the first problem uh, that we are facing. And it basically started uh, about the time I moved back to Alaska. Our temperatures had been increasing. Uh, and when I first flew in, after being gone from Alaska for quite a while, my flight was over 
the Columbia Glacier, which is not too far from Cordova or Valdez. At that time, the glacier was way out towards Prince William Sound. Uh, and over the years, I've watched it recede to where it's now hiding from Prince William Sound. Pack ice is doing the same thing. Uh, in 1976, uh, I was sent to Barrow, now called Ectiapic, um, after its original name, uh, to do a project for my boss as a young uh, law clerk. Uh, and I was able in July to walk out from shore onto the pack ice. You can't do that anymore. The pack ice has gotten less dense. Uh, I've also been in a lot of villages where you could walk uh, on the permafrost. Now it is starting to thaw and you end up uh, falling into bogs. 144 of our villages face some degree of damage right now. Uh, many of them have to begin planning or have already been moving from their original sites because of river erosion, coastal erosion. Uh, the land that they were built upon is beginning to disappear into the rivers, oceans, and to melt into the permafrost. I've had the great pleasure of presenting to cruise ship passengers over the past couple of years. And this is a picture I took of Topeka Glacier and Glacier Bay. <clears throat> Off to the left is Muir Inlet, which you can't see, and the, and the John Muir Glacier. Uh, you can, the, the Muir Glacier is still at tidewater. So try to envision the Topeka Glacier about 50 or 60 feet high coming out into the water. As it recedes up the valley, uh, it is no longer tidewater. It is no longer uh, impacting uh, the water. Uh, and it is changing the nature of the land around it. Now, no one lives in Glacier Bay because it's a national park. But this is what's been happening to glaciers everywhere. I'm going to go back a little bit to the map showing you my homeland. And you can see uh, the red spot down below up to the left side of the Glacier Bay National Park body of water uh, is where we were at, that little um, uh, finger of water pointing down towards the ocean is Muir Inlet. Down at the bottom is Gustavus. The glacier used to go all the way down to that little brown island next to the G, out into what's called icy straits. Now it's all the way back to where I showed you Topeka Glacier is at. That's the extent in a short number of years of the retreat of glaciers because of the warming that they have encountered. Second problem statement, childhood acquired trauma. In 2008, I was introduced to the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. Uh, since I was working uh, with behavioral health, with um, uh, all kinds of social programs, uh, suicide prevention, what I noted and what was confirmed by my finding this study four years after I began working in this world uh, is that uh, the people who live in our village have high rates of a bunch of bad stuff. Using my lean training, I realized that the A study provided a root cause for the issues that they were facing, uh, and the causes are some of what you see in that third bullet point. Here is the prevalence. Non-native and native uh, are side by side, and in the brown you see that no adverse childhood experiences uh, there is a significant gap between native and non-native. And as you look at, we, at going down the number of ACEs, there were 10 that were originally studied. Four plus ACEs are getting to a point of what we refer to as toxic stress. It impacts your behavior substantially. Uh, Alaska natives are about double the rate of four plus adverse childhood experiences uh, as the non-native population. It's a fact, and I was trained in lean thinking to look at facts and then to try to use those to solve problems. Goods and services. Uh, for many of you, this will shock you. 
um, it, I, I misstated in 2018, I made two attempts to visit one of the villages that uh, uh, the company I worked for served, flew into Bethel twice, waited a couple of days for weather to lift, and both times I had to return to Anchorage. The only way to travel to villages is by small planes, and that's how they get a lot of their services and groceries. Be prepared for a shock. These are the food prices we encounter in the bigger communities. $24.99 for a brick of cheese that I buy at cars here in Anchorage for $6.99 on sale, $8.99 regularly. $18.29 for a gallon of milk. Actually, I think that's a half gallon. So $36 for a gallon of milk. And if you like to flavor your coffee with coffee mate like my mother did, almost $13 just to get some coffee mate. Internet services. I have encountered individuals who, when they went over their allocation uh, of, of uh, megabits, owed as much as five or six hundred dollars for a month of service in rural Alaska. Their internet service is shut off in a place where there's very little income. Uh, this quote talks about, whoops, went, talks about how uh, this man pays five or 300 for 10 megabits. Uh, um, and in a lot of out, uh, villages outside of the major areas like Tiakvik or Barrow, uh, they cannot afford to have access to the internet. Unemployment. Uh, unemployment figures are reported for those people who are actively seeking work. In many of these villages, there are no jobs and people stop looking. Uh, and so you see some areas where there's 13, 14%. That it's actually much higher in a lot of villages. And there's a lot of job sharing that goes on. Uh, meaning that if there's a uh, janitorial job in a school, sometimes two, three, four people will share that in order to have some cash income coming in. Educational achievement. Uh, for a lot of the years that I worked for Native Villages, we managed rural head starts. We tried to uh, give our kids a good chance to survive once they hit kindergarten. But despite uh, decades of head start, decades of school uh, education being provided in villages as small as 55 people, what we find is what's reported here in an Atlantic article by Sarah Garland. Uh, Garland. Uh, kids talk about wanting to go to college. They drop out before they get uh, through high school. Uh, and about 2% graduate from college. Uh, it's more important to learn a subsistence lifestyle. But even today, because of climate change, subsistence lifestyles are changing. And because of the way that um, fisheries are allocated in Alaska, most of the resources do not go to people who live in villages. Uh, they find that catch in the oceans reduces the amount of uh, fish that they used to have access to. So looking at the two wind pillars of lean thinking, respect for people and continuous improvement. I'm mindful that Dr. Deming said constantly, 96% of errors and defects in a system uh, are caused by the system. So I tried to apply that thinking to communities. Um, we have a lot of problems. What's the system that they applied to? Well, the systems that I looked at were transportation for getting goods and services to rural Alaska. Uh, education, uh, which is a little bit more complex uh, than uh, we think about because uh, education has a lots, lots of errors and defects throughout the uh, rest of the United States as well. That's why we have so much uh, dependence on, on uh, Congress to do things like no child uh, left behind. Uh, global warming. Uh, was not accepted for a long time, but in rural Alaska, we saw it a long time ago. 
2013, I was on a beach uh, just outside of uh, Kotzebue watching a young seal that had some disease. They were hauling out and dying for some strange reason, but the pack ice had already receded five or six miles from where it used to be. It used to go about 14 miles out there. It was about six, seven, or eight miles at that point. So there are systems that impact, and for each of those systems, we need to think about how we change uh, our thinking, our behaviors to try to address what's occurring uh, in very small communities uh, that don't have a lot of cash. Respect for people in, involves withholding judgment as we look for reasons. We can't just attribute bad behaviors to people is what I learned through the ACE study. And then getting better, continuously improving is something that's important uh, because once you stop improving, then you start to form your biases uh, and uh, begin uh, withdrawing from the system two thinking. So I've gone through a number of problem statements uh, and what I came up with uh, is this graphic, which was prepared by a colleague of mine, the island that you see is Metlakatla. Uh, I don't know if, well, for some reason my cursor is not, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up on the right side of where it says systems integration, ocean cluster concept, if you can see my cursor, that is Ketchikan. Um, Ketchikan is a community of about 8,000 people. Uh, this is uh, Annette Island or Metlakatla, the only Indian reservation in Alaska. I used it because I'm familiar with Metlakatla. It's where my dad lived for 40 years before he passed away. Uh, there is a tremendous airport uh, with about a 10,000 foot runway. And then there is a cross runway. This was used for a time uh, when Pan Am flew into Metlakatla and then seaplanes transported passengers who wanted to get to Ketchikan uh, where they landed on the water. Now they have an airport in Ketchikan that's on the side of a mountain, um, but it's on some flat land. So you fly directly into Ketchikan. About 1,200 people, 1,300 people live here. Uh, it has a lot of resources. Uh, but it is plagued by a number of the problems that uh, I just pointed out, high prices, uh, uh, education system that is not doing real well with, with young people, lack of jobs and opportunities so, so that people have to, turn, to uh, uh, move away. And so this picture is the thinking that we began to look at as a system. And so Starlink is a new addition to Alaska, uh, the low uh, altitude um, uh, system of, of satellites that are beginning to provide services to rural Alaska. The bandwidth is going up substantially and, uh, and, it's, and we're able to see a joining of the rest of the world without those five, $600 bills that come in, of which many people can't afford to pay, Starlink uh, is about $99 a month. It opens up a number of educational opportunities. It opens up a number of service uh, uh, potential that um, uh, I've tried to work with over the past couple of decades. Uh, and it also got me to thinking about what did a small system of Alaska Native villages look like years ago? They met all of their own needs. One of my observations in uh, Metlakatla is that when it was populated in the late 1800s, the people who lived there and moved there from Canada built their houses. They harvested trees. They had a small sawmill. They built a row of houses, they built a church, uh, they built stores and other buildings that were necessary and they did it as a community. I'm not sure why that's moving, uh, but they did it as a community and those houses were still functional. They were being lived in 
in the 1970s when I spent time in Metlakatla living with my dad. At that time, uh, we didn't have great communications uh, and the only way to call in and out was, uh, was by a radio telephone line, which wasn't always intact today. Um, we're finding that we now have a lot of things that have made it easier. So you're seeing airplanes uh, off to the left. You're seeing a boat down to the right. Um, my dad showed me that uh, you could actually program a, a, a vessel in Seattle uh, today, or actually b- before he passed away, and you could set it to arrive in Kodiak and you could leave it going by itself. Now that's not shocking to us today because uh, various automobiles are, try- are, attempt- are working on that right now. But back then <clears throat> it was very unusual because we didn't have a lot of uh, electronic capability. One of the big problems we have too is energy. Uh, and what we're now finding is that uh, energy can be produced in a number of ways. Uh, solar is becoming cheaper. Uh, water energy has been looked at. There is some hydropower on Prince of Wales and there's some hydropower in Southeast Alaska. Uh, but still we're looking at 60, 70 cents a kilowatt, which makes it very difficult. So energy is a big problem that we have to consider when we're looking at all communities and these villages of the future need to solve energy uh, as a problem. Looking at Econom- or educational access. One of the things that started here in Mount Edgecombe is a movement towards education uh, that followed some of the teachings of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Uh, my my uh, stepmother and dad were friends with a man named Larry Roshelo. Uh, he was superintendent of schools uh, back uh, when my brothers and sisters were very young. Mr. Roshlow then went up to the Mount Edgecombe boarding school. And while he was there, he, uh, along with a teacher, went and learned uh, some of, of the Japanese management systems. And they began applying them to education. I learned about it in 1989 when, as a faculty member at the University of Alaska Southeast, I visited an international business class that was being conducted there by the, by the students. Uh, they had a smoking, a salmon smoking machine purchased for them. They were taught to do everything. They figured out how to brine the salmon and the appropriate brine to use, the appropriate uh, flavoring, the smoking, the packaging, the marketing. And they ended up getting a $400,000 contract from a Japanese trader to sell their product to. Unsolicited, a Korean uh, trader inquired whether they would accept a $600,000 contract to provide some of their smoked salmon to them. This was all done by the kids themselves. The educational system at Mount Edgecombe was producing kids who were graduating, uh, who were learning, and who were going off to college. They understood what college was. And Mr. Roshelow, uh then moved to the Chugach School District, which is where I worked in the map that I showed you, Uh, And the Chugach School District, which had small communities, introduced an educational system that for the nine years I worked for the tribes in the region, graduated every single student that attended that school district. No dropouts. And many of them went on to college. Uh, That, to me, was astounding and a part of the learning that I went through. Uh, And then looking at Uh, economic development. I had worked in that arena for quite a while, and I looked at all of the things that were available here, uh, one of which was this concept in the past uh, 10, 15 years of an ocean cluster. We've been studying the oceans uh, a lot more recently, and I looked at the harbor facilities here, and I said, Well, why would you send uh, a ship from Seattle or San Francisco or San Diego up to Alaska 
when you could have a smaller ship stationed here to go out and check buoys, to go out and check uh, these uh, underwater submarines that collect data. Uh, and then if with a good connection to the internet, which is the satellite you see up there, uh, transform data back and forth, but even more so getting the kids interested in the science so that perhaps they would begin to long distance, begin working on their degrees uh, and bring the science to villages. Uh, there are a lot of other activities that can occur up here. Uh, you see a lot of freshwater lakes on the island. One of my colleagues um, pointed out that Arctic char uh, was growing in Washington state. Uh, Arctic char is a freshwater fish that grows rapidly and grows in great density. It is uh, like a trout in many respects, uh, and you could actually grow it uh, and it would be, provide a consistent output so that you could use the transportation that's there to send it down to Seattle, San Francisco, any place that uh, could put Arctic char on a menu, it would be, be a high value item. Same thing for clams, oysters, uh, other uh, fish and shellfish. Uh, the forests there are now young growth timber. Uh, they're probably about uh, 70 to 90 feet high. They can produce good, straight, high quality lumber. Uh, a mill is um, uh, already there. They can cut it, uh, and they can dry it out, and they could actually come back to building houses. This got me to thinking about the sustainability of a small community and how you could actually begin to replace a lot of what we purchase from outside and do the work internally. Uh, you might have to buy some uh, plumbing supplies and, and the like. But the whole idea was, let's rethink, revision, reimagine the community as a system. The final thing I want to leave you with as we move on to the discussion part, uh, and I hope you've been uh, thinking uh, about what it is that could be done for this community or your community to try to enhance uh, community survival. Uh, when I lived there in the 1970s, uh, the community had about 2,400 people. They had a thriving business cutting timber, but they were selling it all to uh, Japan at the time. Uh, they had a lot of uh, fishing vessels, but then the fishing uh, rights were privatized and you had to have a limited entry permit. That permit had a value. And what happened is, is that a lot of people had to sell their permits uh, many for tax problems, uh, many because they passed away and, the, and uh, the family needed money because the breadwinner was no longer there. A lot of problems and issues to solve, and I'm not trying to solve them all right here. What I'm doing is trying to present a different way of thinking on how we can begin to move uh, some of the goods and services that are purchased uh, from outside inside. And I have one last story to kind of start off the thinking. I'm not the originator of these ideas. A friend of mine by the name of Daryl Jordan explained to me a concept that he and a partner, a man by the name of Ed Cronick, had come up with to grow vegetables in Barrow, Alaska using a tower concept of hydroponics that they saw at uh, Chicago's O'Hare uh, Airport, uh, they planned a project. They looked for people and companies who would buy that. And what they discovered is that in vacant uh, units, vacant large places in Barrow, they could put in these hydroponic towers and they could warm the water to 72 degrees, which is when plants grow best, but they could leave the ambient air temperature down around 55. It didn't have to be real warm for the plants to grow, only the warm water. Chevron was operating um, a lot of oil wells and oil platforms. They committed to a $500,000 grant, a $2 million loan, and agreed to buy all of their output and then Daryl and Ed looked at other potential buyers and they found that school districts are obligated to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables 
from a source within 75 miles. All of these things were in place. Unfortunately, um, the, the village corporation that was presented the opportunity declined it. Uh, that was a lot of years ago, about 25 years ago. All of that equipment still sits in Barrow. So I thought in a community like Metlakatla with fresh water, uh, one of the problems we have for kids is that they can't find employment. But as I was working for a, a local company here in Anchorage, I was introduced by one of our behavioral health specialists to a project that he had worked on. Uh, and in the middle of Anchorage was one of these hydroponic farms. Uh, and there was a grant that they had to involve you know, young people, teenagers. Uh, today, teenagers can't work in areas with, uh, with uh, equipment that might be dangerous for them. Uh, and there are very few jobs uh, in Anchorage uh, for teenagers. And what I thought was, is that this would be a perfect opportunity. You could combine it with the education system. Uh, you could learn uh, biology, plant biology, uh, while at the same time, you are import substituting um, fresh vegetables for vegetables that might otherwise come from Florida, Chile, or California. And by the time they reach you, they're starting to turn brown. Uh, I have... Uh, taken about 40 minutes so I want to uh, break away and at this point um, let me see if I can uh, see more people um, in in the chat let me take a look uh, Jim has anything come in that uh, um, asks questions um, chat okay well so what I want to ask is what kind of thoughts and ideas do you guys have on what you would do for your community uh, in the areas that uh, I presented the problem statements in? And so I'm going to uh, try to advance to the next one. These are the six issues that I looked at. Climate change, childhood acquired trauma, high cost of goods and services, connectivity, unemployment, and educational achievement. And that, uh, with that, I'll open it up and um, I don't know if we uh, can unmute folk or how, but um, I I'd like to hear your thoughts and ideas, your system to thinking about what we might be able to do for a rural Alaska village or for your community. So don't be bashful. If anybody has any questions, they could, they could post them in the chat, any comments or questions. I will wait patiently. Okay, I'll mention something else. Uh, again, I'm not the originator of these ideas, uh, but I have a lot of very smart friends. And uh, last week I listened to a presentation by one of them. She and her company are working on drone delivery of prescription medications from a central area, uh, in this case, at Soldatna, Alaska, about uh, 60 miles south of where I'm at in Anchorage. Uh, and what they're at, wanting to do is to ship prescription medications by drone to communities within a 500 mile radius. Um, I've run rural healthcare systems. And one of the problems that we have, uh, of course, is the control of prescription medications belongs, especially uh, the very addictive ones, to physicians, uh, to physicians' assistants and advanced nurse practitioners. And most communities don't have those. Uh, for them to get medications has involved mail uh, in the past. And today what we're looking at is a drone that can carry a payload of up to 65 pounds, can travel up to 600 miles, uh, and is programmed. Uh, and a, a drone pilot watches that. So that was one of the income opportunities, I thought, to um, have drone pilots, uh, since internet connectivity would be coming in, live and work in a village. Um, Okay, 
There is something in the chat. Let me take a look at it. It says, I worked for several years with an organization that promotes local organizing for mutual aid. They have a network that shares um, ideas and resources. I can recommend the Sociocracy 2.0 for organizing more effectively. That is very on point. Uh, in, a, in the lean organizations that I, I work with, I try very hard to engage uh, employee minds. It's a culture change for most of my employees. Uh, I remember mentioning early on in my uh, CEO career um, something that I thought might be a good idea to happen. And two weeks later, one of my uh, young employees come up and said they were working on it. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's put the brakes on, <laughs> on here. Um, I learned you don't mention things uh, to employees who want to impress you uh, because they will think that you want that done. What I was trying to do was to, was to begin uh, feeding uh, the creative thinking ability of employees and have them come up with ideas. I learned that I had to, as a CEO, stop mentioning things uh, or someone would feel that they needed to happen. So encouraging and organizing on a community level in a way that doesn't look like you're mandating something is critical and important. So for example, uh, in the educational system, uh, I thought uh, moving to a system for rural Alaska, more like uh, the Chugach school district system, uh, one where students are given an opportunity uh, to go across six or seven curriculum lines. And if they find that they're excited by one of them, they don't have to progress with every other student. They can accelerate. And the, student, the teachers are there helping them accelerate until they reach a point uh, where they have achieved the portfolio of knowledge uh, that the, the school district wanted them to achieve. And then they can move to another area. So it's self-directed by interest in many ways. Uh, another way that um, uh, some of these rural Alaska villages are beginning to uh, interact with their children. I don't know how many of you have been to Alaska, but as an eight-year-old boy in uh, Cordova, um, I, I saw my first horse. And uh, I never saw uh, zebras. We didn't have a zoo. There were lots of animals that I wasn't familiar with, but I could go down to the local dump and see black bears. I understood black bears, but black bears were not a part of our curriculum. We were doing C. Dick and Jane uh, at the time. We were learning uh, English uh, and we were not allowed to be excited uh, about what it is that we were learning. Today, we have curricula that talks in terms of counting uh, about uh, herring. So instead of, of uh, counting uh, one sheep, two sheep, three sheep, four sheep, I still don't see many sheep. There are goats in Alaska, but not sheep. Um, so what we're doing instead is we're talking about uh, one uh, herring, two herring, three herring, four. I just bought a book that teaches that in English and in Clinket for my grandson uh, who lives in uh, Australia. Uh, and I agree with uh, Mr. Dalton. Karen Martin is wonderful. Um, and uh, I actually used uh, her book on how to um, prioritize projects for implementation. Uh, and I think that's something that could be applied to a community as well. Uh, so looking at uh, Metlakatla uh, right now, everything is driven by politicians uh, or by CEOs of the various native organizations, the Indian Health Service, very little room for community input. Uh, I learned that uh, when I was working for a number of uh, organizations, that rarely did anyone go in and ask what it is that they wanted. So we began going in to ask. Uh, and it was very difficult to try and get thoughts and ideas, uh, especially about business opportunities, 
uh, because many of them were driven by politicians. So one of the organizations that I worked for in one of the villages, they were fixated on canneries. Uh, they wanted to continue to go out and catch pink salmon <clears throat> to run it through their cannery uh, when pink salmon was not selling. Uh, at the time instead, what uh, the progressive um, and more aggressive uh, seafood manufacturers were doing was to try and uh, package pink salmon, transport it quickly to market, uh, and sell it as a fresh product. Not many people seem to eat uh, canned salmon uh, anymore. So a lot of the red salmon in Bristol Bay and in the Copper River uh, instead of being canned like they were back in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and even the 70s, are now being shipped uh, as fresh product or frozen uh, immediately, uh, and they're preserved for a long period of time. Uh, so looking at a community like uh, Metlakatla uh, and looking at the fishing boats that were around there, uh, they do have a cannery, but similar to what happened with the Mount Edgecombe uh, classes. Uh, today, good high quality smoked salmon commands a, a fairly high price. Uh, looking at kelp and the different kinds of seafood, those are things that can assist with climate change because uh, kelp and seaweed absorb a lot of carbon. Uh, and kelp also fits into a lot of different kinds of foods. So those are the types of industries that might work in a small community if the community would like for them uh, to happen. Uh, so looking at replacing uh, some of what it is that um, they import in, in the way of vegetables uh, could happen hydroponically. Uh, some of the foodstuffs that you can raise uh, in Alaska, we can't do fish farming in the ocean, but you can do things like Arctic char uh, those are foods that can be grown and utilized locally and also sold somewhere for cash income. Uh, another thing that I uh, spoke about, and I'm still trying to look at the chat. Okay, someone has to drop off and go to a next meeting. Um, someone would like to get together for a chat after the presentation. Uh, still no thoughts or ideas. I'm open to whatever anyone uh, is interested in in uh, providing. These are this is a real problem to solve in Alaska. This is why I'm doing this uh, to, to try and get folk to um, suggest ideas. We have to move up to 40 different villages because the land that they are going to locate on will be gone uh, in the next 20 or 30 years years it's disappearing uh, quite rapidly and let me check the time there's about 11 minutes left right jim so and the six issues anyone have anything yeah. to offer before i go into um, somehow this is not moving again let me go back okay so the six issues uh, climate change is a big one um Childhood acquired trauma. Part of uh, my uh, dreams for a village of the future is that we address the issues that are caused by things that happen to us as children. That's a much longer conversation than we have time for here. But having a community adopt some of the lean principles like no judgments, uh, looking at systems that cause problems. Let me give you a couple of. Uh, ideas about systems that cause problems. Alaska natives used to have diets high in fish, uh, marine mammals, and high in omega-3s. Uh, in, in the mid to late 1970s, the way food was produced in the U.S. began to take away the omega-3s that you could get from foods. And some of the problems that occur when we have low levels of omega-3s in our bodies uh, are severe. A, a psychiatrist that did research for the National Institutes for Health, uh, for example, found that suicide in veterans increased with less omega-3s in their blood. 
by as much as 42%. He did research on binge drinking and alcoholism and found that supplementing individuals with omega-3s for a period of four months uh, at a a uh, quantity of four grams reduced binge drinking without any other intervention, no behavioral health, no addiction, uh, uh, no treatment, reduced binge drinking by 80%. And in prisons, supplementation with omega-3s re reduced violence. These are some of the things that I learned as a consequence of being introduced to the Deming systems thinking. Uh, the high cost of goods and services we're addressing by in, in this thinking by having more of those done locally and using a population that doesn't have employment opportunities, namely teenagers who are not yet 16 and can't, and can't work with uh, different kinds of equipment, uh, having them work to help raise the food uh, for the community. They can be paid for that. Uh, and, and I don't see any more um, questions or comments. I will look quickly to see anything else. Okay, someone digging up. Yeah. Um, so let me go into something that I learned in the last uh, few minutes. Um, Maslow is someone that everyone seems to know when I talk about uh, him but they know about the pyramid. Uh, they know about uh, the, the five levels that Maslow talked about. He didn't talk about it in terms of a pyramid. That was someone else who applied that. But, uh, this is something that uh, had a big impact on me. And then in the last two years, I discovered that in the last three years of his life, Maslow began writing about the concept of self-transcendence. Native self-actualization is something that Maslow experienced as a young man uh, when he was uh, living for six weeks on the Blackfoot reservation. What he discovered and what the Blackfoot did was to respect their children in a way that when a child was born, they were not an empty vessel that needed filling. Instead, the Blackfoot saw them as already inherently wise, but it was the tribe's responsibility to make sure that all of their uh, cultural protocols raise the children to realize everything that they believe that they were. This has guided a lot of my thinking recently in terms of the workplace. I would love to see all employees self-actualized. The way that self-transcendence worked is that, uh, is that there were individuals within the native community who were very good at uh, accumulating wealth. They knew and understood things that others did not. And every year on the Blackfoot reservation, the Blackfeet leaders would come in uh, and teepees would be placed in the round and in the middle was all of the accumulation for the past year. The individuals who were self-actualized would explain how it was that they were able to accumulate the wealth that sat in front of them and then they gave it away. So part of what I have been thinking about is that uh, in Metlakatla, money was sought because of the timber that was there and all the timber was cut and sold to Japan. If it had been a local resource, it would have been used to build homes. Instead, there are a dearth of homes in Metlakatla right now. And perhaps some of this kind of thinking can be reintegrated um, into some of the communities. Uh, and instead of accumulation of wealth, we begin to see a spreading of that wealth. With that, I see I am over time. I want to thank everyone who uh, participated uh, in in this uh, and and allowed me to express some of my opinions. Uh, and I am still uh, opening or open to any conversations. Uh, I don't know if on the front end I put my uh, email address. Um, uh, I, I may have not, but uh, 
Uh, I am Patrick M. Anderson, S-O-N-907 at gmail.com. And with that, I will say thank you in Klinkit, Gunachish, and uh, these are the tremendous mountains and waters that I get to live to in, in my home country in Alaska. So Jim, back to you. All right, thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, what a, be what a beautiful scene, uh, a little bit better than what I'm looking at here in central Indiana. <laughs> but thank you so much for presenting today, Patrick, and, and, and such a insightful and enlightening um, discussion and uh, subject. And thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Um, remember, you will receive a link to view the recordings within a few days. And we look forward to seeing you soon. So have a great day. Thank you. All right. And thank you as well.